The dry season has begun, and the landscape is slowly succumbing to it. In the part of the supercontinent of Pangaea that will one day be North America, animals rarely come out during the hottest parts of the day, preferring the cooler mornings and afternoons. A small dinosaur, Camposaurus, is making her way down to a shrinking river. Dinosaurs are well adapted for water retention, but she knows this river may dry up soon, so she drinks from it while the going is good. Stepping through the ferns near the water's edge, she scans the area for predators. It could be anything from Rawasukians to larger dinosaurs. Feeling safe, she lowers her head down and scoops up the water with her long jaws. She has been drinking for about two seconds, when a huge pair of jaws erupt from the water in front of her. Her reflexes are too slow, and before she can jump out of the way, the jaws clamp down on her midsection, and dozens of conical teeth pierce into her. The creature's oddly shaped skull is specifically evolved to grasp onto struggling prey. The Camposaurus squeals briefly before her attacker pulls itself backwards and disappears back into the river, holding onto the small dinosaur to drown it. The aquatic, heavily armoured reptile may look and act like a crocodile, but he is a part of a more ancient group of Triassic hunters, known as Thytosaurs. The ancestors of modern crocodilians at this time are more terrestrial, for now it is the Phytosaurs that rule the rivers and lakes of the supercontinent. While they have the long toothy jaws and semi-aquatic lifestyle of modern crocs, their jaws and skulls are far more varied, and their nostrils are near the eyes as opposed to near the end of the snout. Their ankles are not as developed as crocodilians either, and they have armored osteoderms along their bellies, not just along their backs. There are many species, the one that just secured himself a Camposaurus is a Macera proposus. While many of his cousins have adapted for hunting swift fish, he is built for tackling large, heavy prey, the Camposaurus being nowhere near the largest creature he could take down. The successful reptile rises to the surface and begins to tear apart his catch into more sizable pieces. As he does this, he notices the change in the water too late. Coming up from behind him is another semi-aquatic reptile, Van Clevia. The chimera of lizard and otter swam forward, and just as the phytosaur moved out of its path, the smaller Van Clevia bit down on the drowned Camposaurus's tail, and ripped it cleanly from its body. He didn't stop swimming and raced away from the large reptile that only just realized what happened. Had the phytosaur known the intruder was smaller than him, he would have stood his ground, but was caught off guard and now had a noticeably smaller meal. Below them both, a large temnospondyl amphibian watches the whole situation unfold, laying silent and unmoving, content to let the reptiles compete with each other, and wait for any small fish to come close enough and get snapped up in his jaws. Further downriver, where the water is shallower, a herd of Placerius are on their own journey to quench their thirst. Waddling around, the adults are the younger members of the herd, still energetic and playful. Marching through the thick mud to get to the river does slow them down, but Placerius are no strangers to wallowing in mud. The herd can drink from the muddy area and not risk getting too close to the river, where phytosaurs may be waiting. As the adults drink from and even roll in the mud, one juvenile marches closer to the river's edge and spots something in the water just breaking the surface. It looks like a submerged log, and the little male has no idea he is staring at the head of another species of phytosaur, Smilosuchus, one of the largest of the whole family, though only the top of his head is visible, and there is plenty of open ground between it and the young Basirius, so the youngster doesn't sense any danger. From behind the long skull, an armored back rises out of the water, and a powerful tail propels it forward its path taking it straight towards the young Placerius. Though the youngster didn't move, he was so far away from the water's edge, but as the predator got closer it lifted its head out of the water and it slid up onto the mud and the momentum of its tail pushed it forward till its whole body length was out of the water and it didn't stop. The Smilosuchus slid across the wet earth using its legs to keep up its speed, far faster than it could on solid ground 
and still beating its tail to accelerate forward. The huge 9 meter carnivore splashed towards the Viserys, making the herd call out and try to walk backwards, including the young male. But as he tried to turn around, the massive Phytosaur was basically right beside him. Jaws gaped wide, and in a flash, closed, impaling the small Viserys on long, tusk-like teeth. The victim squealed as he was lifted into the air, and the Smilosuchus twisted his long body to turn back to the water. All the herd was calling out now, and the large males moved forward to put themselves between the remaining young and the threat, but none tried to save the impaled juvenile. It was already too late. Slowly, the predator slid his body back to the water, his prey now barely struggling. Before he got back to the water's edge and slivered below the surface, his entire 9 meter body disappearing from sight. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the family of reptiles that were the crocodiles before being replaced by real crocodiles, phytosaurs. So let's clear up any confusion first. Phytosaurs are not crocodilians, though they aren't too distantly related. The order of Phytosauria lived during the mid to late Triassic period and had a wide range of genuses and filled many niches, most of them semi-aquatic predators. The exact place of Phytosaurs in the reptile family tree has been debated for decades, especially whether or not they belong in the Archosaur family or just outside in the Archosaura forms. In 2016, the most recent update found that Phytosauria was indeed in Archosauria, and even in Pseudosuchia, meaning they are a sister group to the modern crocodilians and their many extinct relatives, such as the Ateosaurs and the Rauasugians, though this may change with additional research and finds. So with phylogeny out of the way, what exactly separates them from the semi-aquatic crocodilians? After all, they share many traits such as long jaws, armoured bodies, short limbs, and long tails evolved for swimming. But looking closely, we can see clear differences, such as Phytosaur's nostrils are located near the eyes, or in some cases above them, much like many modern cetaceans. While modern crocs have their nostrils at the end of their snouts. Modern crocs have osteoderm armour along their backs and the top of their tails, while Phytosaurs have armour that covers most of their body, even their undersides, as well as having gastralia, or belly ribs. Phytosaurs also have a more primitive ankle structure than modern crocs, or even their oldest ancestors. Finally, Phytosaurs lack a secondary palate, which is a bony structure that divides the nasal cavity from the oral cavity, which in crocodilians allows them to breathe while their mouths are full of water. However, it's theorised that Phytosaurs may have had a fleshy palate, which of course wouldn't fossilise. Because they first appeared during the Middle Triassic, a time when all the continents were fused together, Phytosaurs were able to spread across the globe and have been found in Europe, North America, India, Morocco, Thailand, Brazil, Greenland and Madagascar. Though almost all would stick to the semi-aquatic predator niche, there are still a lot of variation in this family, ranging from body size to how their jaws were built. So let's take a look at some particular species to show just what I mean. Diang Dongasuchus is the earliest known ancestors of Phytosaurs, found in China in 2012, living between 242 and 237 million years ago. It was about 1.5 meters long, and had longer limbs than many of its descendants, so it wasn't as adapted to aquatic life. Its flat jaws, with large serrated teeth and bulging eyes, point to it being a generalist, and fish remains were found in its gut, showing that it was going after aquatic prey. Angostura finus is an early, more derived species from the US, found in 1913, that lived between 237 and 208 million years ago. It may have grown up to 7 or 8 meters in length, its skull alone was 120 centimeters. As we can see, the jaws were long and thin, much like a modern gharials, and was packed with long, thin teeth, as well as having a downward notch on the upper jaw. These are good indicators that, like the gharial, it was primarily a piscivore, snapping up slippery fish with quick strikes. 
Nigrosaurus was found in Germany in 1866 and lived between 228 and 201 million years ago. Nicrosaurus may have been the most terrestrial of its family, as its limbs and joints are better suited to hold itself in a more erect stance. Whether it hunted more on land, or was simply better suited to moving on land, is more up for debate. Nicrosaurus had a very tall skull, and had multiple types of teeth in its jaws, varying from wide, laterally compressed blade-like teeth, to cylindrical, recurved, caniform teeth. Interestingly, microwear on its teeth indicate that Nicrosaurus was going after hard-shelled invertebrates, using its thick jaws to crush open shells and armor. Smilosuchus was discovered in the US in 1995, and lived between 221 and 205 million years ago. It may have been one of the largest dinosaurs, with estimates putting it between 7 and 12 meters in length. The skull alone was 1.5 meters long, with curved blade-like teeth in the back for cutting, and long tusks at the very tip of the jaws for impaling and securing prey. It was likely an ambush predator, launching itself at animals drinking from the water's edge, like modern crocodiles. Macaropostropus is a genus also from the US that has up to seven species within it, all of which having vastly different sizes of skulls and morphologies. From long flat skulls to ones with multiple curves and notches, these notches evolved so that no matter where prey were caught in its jaws, they had basically no chance of escape. Colossosuchus was found in India and was only named in 2023. Interestingly, the vast amount of its species remains come from a single bone bed, where up to 21 individuals were found, including juveniles, subadults, and fully grown individuals. Adults are estimated to have grown up to 8 meters in length. They have a typical build with long narrow jaws, with the upper jaw ending in a notch of 70 degrees. So as we can see, this family was very widespread and diverse, filling many different niches and growing to massive sizes, in many cases being top order carnivores. So what happened to them? And how did the Sukians take over from them? Well, like many species that were doing well during the late Triassic, it all came crashing down with the end Triassic mass extinction. Though the exact cause of this are still debated, many believe that mass amounts of volcanic activity decimated the world at this time, poisoning the atmosphere and the air, with the worst affected areas being those around the equator. As with most mass extinctions, the large fauna were most affected, and that would include the dinosaurs, which were wiped out leaving their niches open, which the, at the time, mostly terrestrial Sukians would eventually take over, leading to the evolution of today's modern crocodilian families. However, this may not be the whole story. A few fossils in France, China, and England of what may be dinosaurs have been found in early Jurassic rocks, so perhaps a few species were able to pull through and live after the end Triassic mass extinction, at least for a little while. With that being said, most of these are indeterminate species or are from rocks that could also be from the end of the Triassic, so more fossils need to be found and more research needs to be done. But what do you think of the phytosaurs? They certainly had gnarly looking jaws, that's for sure. And for my question of the week, is there a particular genus of these reptiles you'd like me to do a more in-depth breakdown on in the future? Until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.